beginning at verse 6, reading to verse 13, Revelation chapter 14. Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come. And worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea, and springs of water. And another angel followed, saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Then a third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast and his image and receives his mark on his forehead or on his hand, he himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation. He shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascends forever and ever. And they have no rest day or night, whoever worshiped the beast and his image and whoever receives the mark of his name. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Then I heard a voice from heaven saying to me, Right, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors and their works follow them. Chapter 14, as I mentioned before, is the chapter that reveals the ultimate victory of the Lord Jesus Christ. Chapter 14 gives us a panoramic view of this period in time that is called the Tribulation. And it gives to us this view from the standpoint of Jesus' victory. As I mentioned to you, this chapter has been called a preview of coming attractions. Now, the verses that we have looked at, the verses here in chapter 14, contain a prophetic view of his ultimate triumph, his return to the earth. And they also reveal the beginning of his thousand-year reign at the end of the tribulation and his second coming. I mentioned to you that this material is not placed in a chronological order, but it's what is called a prophetic overview. The chapter begins with the assurance that Jesus will stand on Mount Zion, with his followers, that will occur after his second coming and concludes with a series of announcements of judgment. The chapter has a picture of Jesus, as we saw in verse 1, uh, standing on Mount Zion with 144,000. And that was a, a picture of Jesus standing victorious after his return. And with him, we saw in the first few verses, uh, with him were the Jewish believers who were protected throughout the tribulation. This 144,000 already being mentioned in chapters 7 as well as chapter 9. And as we looked at this, remember with me, John heard the sound of praise that was emanating from heaven. There was joyful singing because Jesus Christ reigns. What you have are the angels, the Old Testament saints, you have the raptured church, and the tribulation martyrs, and they're all praising God. But the song has a personal experiential element that only the 144,000 can sing. It says in verse 3, they sang as it were a new song before the throne, before the four living creatures and the elders, and no one could learn that song except the 144,000 who were redeemed from the earth. So they had an experience that they're singing about. They're singing from experience. It's something that they personally went through, and that's what's fueling them as they praise the Lord. Now, of course... All redeemed sing a song of praise because God has redeemed us. But in their case, they sing a song of redemption from a wellspring of a different experience. They'd gone through and survived the tribulation, and they were kept by God in a miraculous way. They, like Noah, had been kept from the wrath of God, and uh, they had been protected by God's grace. They had seen other people suffer. They had seen others die. But they're singing in praise because they had been protected from pain and they had been protected from death. The psalmist in Psalm 34, 17 says, The righteous cry out 
the Lord hears and delivers them out of all their troubles. And they could say, this is exactly our experience. God has done that. And so as they've been praising and worshiping the Lord, they were people who were redeemed and they were people who followed the Lamb wherever he went. And they were people without deceit or hypocrisy. And we were introduced to them in verses 1 through 5. Now, when we get to verse 6, he begins there by saying, I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth. Notice, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. And so this angel is in addition to the angels that we've already seen throughout the book of Revelation. We've seen angels referred to chapter 8, chapter 10. This one here uh, is an unnamed angel. And what we have is the vision of judgment. Now, if we were looking at the chronology of this, this occurs near the end of the tribulation, the seven-year period. Notice how he says the angel is flying in the midst of heaven. The midst of heaven is referring to what we would call, and this is interesting as I was studying this, I thought how, how interesting that he would picture it. It, it. When he says in the midst of heaven, it's really another picture of what we would call high noon. It's, it's where the sun reaches its highest point. And it's another way of saying that this angel, as he's there in the midst of heaven, is most clearly able to be seen by the people on the earth. Now, as you're looking at this, when he says, I see another or I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, heaven uh, during this time, we need to remember that the world has already gone through devastation through the first two judgments or series of judgments that God has brought. The constant judgments have rocked the globe. The inhabitants are going through tremendous trauma. During this time, the gospel has been continued uh, being proclaimed. We've seen that. We have the 144,000 who are gospel witnesses. We have those who are referred to as the two witnesses. There are those who are saved by their ministry, and they are also sharing. The gospel has been going out powerfully. The gospel has been going out relentlessly. People are hearing the message, and they're turning to Christ. But in spite of this, and this is the thing that is truly amazing to me, but in spite of this, in spite of all that's going on, the world has continued rejecting the message of Jesus Christ. The world continues to do that. People can see the remarkable work that God did in your life. They can see it. And there's no denying it. There's no way they can argue and say it didn't happen. They knew you. They knew what you were like. They had you pegged. They knew how you would act, what you were like in different circumstances and situations. They knew that you were just one monster sinner. They knew that. Then you got saved. And they say, what happened to you? I remember my cousin, Ray, how when I got saved, he and I, well, we grew up, he was very, we were very close. We grew up together. He was a few years older than me, about three years older than me. But I remember after I got saved, he and I were talking on one occasion, and he said to me, what happened to you? You used to be fun. And he's not the only person who said that. What happened to you? What he was simply saying is, you're not the same person. What happened? How did you change, and why did you change? And I remember sharing with Ray about that, how that, uh, you know, Ray, you know, I was fun because I was a drunk. I was fun because I was foolish, and I said foolish things and did foolish things, and like a clown, and people liked me that way. But I didn't like myself that way. That's why I got saved. That's one of the reasons. I didn't like what I was. I didn't like how I was. And I needed something new. But you share with them, and they say, well, that's good for you. That's good for you. You, need, you needed God. There's no doubt about it. You needed God. But I don't. How many of you have heard that? We've all heard that in one form or another. If you share your faith, you will hear it. They'll say, yeah, you needed God. <laughs> you needed God. You needed anything. You needed something. God's good. But that's about it. But when you say, but you need the Lord too. I said, no, no, I really don't. I'm making it. I remember one of my friends, his name's Jim, and Jim and I, not Gemini, Jim and I, 
were very good friends for a long time. And, uh, but he was the most miserable guy. He complained about everything all the time. I know none of us in this room ever complain, you know, but pretend, or maybe you know somebody who does. Jim was a complainer, constantly upset about one thing or another. Nothing was ever any good, not good enough for him. And one day I, I shared, he was one of my dearest friends, and I, I shared Jimmy. I said, you need the Lord, man. He goes, why? Why do I need God? I said, because you you got no joy, man, because you're miserable. You have no joy. And he goes, I got a lot of joy. Don't tell me I don't have joy. I said, yeah, if you've got joy, you know, if it's inside, let your face know it then. <laughs> now, you need that. Well, that's the way it is, guys, and you know it, and I know it. Even under the most severe judgments, even with remarkable things like these witnesses, we've already looked at them, they're preaching. If somebody opposes them, they call fire down and consume them. This, ha this had to have gotten their attention. Could you imagine at the harvest crusade with Pastor Greg and somebody's messing around and he brings fire down on him, burns them up right there? Could you imagine what that would do? Get your attention. But what did they do? They continued cursing God. That's what a hardened heart does. And that's what happens. It's not something that may happen. Some, that kind of thing happens right now. In Revelation 9, as mentioned, verses 20 and 21, the rest of mankind who were not killed by the plagues did not repent of the works of their hands, nor give up worshiping demons and idols of gold and silver and bronze and stone and wood, which cannot either see or hear or walk, nor did they repent of their murders or their sorceries or their immorality or their thefts. They did not repent, even though all of these things are taking place. And so here you have an angel in verse 6, and the angel has noticed with me the everlasting gospel. The everlasting gospel. When you read your Bible, the gospel, it's interesting, is often referred to, the gospel is referred to in, in various ways. We know it as the gospel. The word gospel speaks of uh, great news. That's what it literally means, the good news, or the great news. And so we speak of the gospel, the God spell, really, as being the great news of salvation. And so we use the word gospel. We're preaching the gospel and all. But in the Bible, it's referred to in various ways. You'll see it referred to as the gospel of the kingdom. You'll see it referred to as the gospel of God. You'll see it referred to as the gospel of peace. It's also referred to as the gospel of grace. But here it is called the everlasting gospel. When it's called everlasting, the everlasting gospel, the word everlasting speaks of ageless. It's speaking of an unchanged message, an ageless, unchanged message that reveals and vindicates the righteousness of God. And because it does not change, it is everlasting because as it reveals the righteousness of God, it also reveals the way to eternal life. So it's an eternal gospel because this eternal, changeless, age-abiding message is the message that God gives to mankind so that you might have life. Jesus in John 5, 24 said it like this. He said, most assuredly, I say unto you, he who hears my word and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life, shall not come into judgment, but has passed from death unto life. When you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, you're saved. And God so loved us that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have what? Everlasting life. So Jesus gives to us life, and that more abundantly. The everlasting gospel, unchanging gospel, is the way for you, when you embrace by faith the message, to have an everlasting life. So it's the everlasting gospel. That's, by the way, why it is so important for 
ministers of the gospel, which is all of us who are born again, pastor teachers like myself, to make sure we give the gospel. That's why it's so important. I have my opinions, and every once in a while you'll hear them. First service, for those who were with me, it's the only I gave you some opinions. And I didn't give them again, second or third. You have your opinions. My opinions don't save anybody. If I have somebody come to my door and they bring a message of salvation that's incorrect, my opinion isn't going to save them. Well, that's what you think. That's your right to believe that. I can say this is what I feel and this is what I... But, but, but my feelings and my opinions and, and your feelings and your opinions won't save anybody. They won't save anybody. But the gospel does. That's why we need to stay in God's word. That's why we need to know God's word. And that's why we need to proclaim God's word. Because it is the everlasting gospel. Now, if it doesn't matter to somebody, that's because they really haven't fully understood the depth and importance of God's word. That's where that problem is. And the temptation sometimes in churches even today is to try to fill up the pews, but not to fill up the people. Because if you bring the full counsel of God, let's face it, there are times when I'm hearing a Bible study and I'm going, oh, thank you for all those blessings, God. Those are so good. You mean I'm the head, not the tail? Ooh, hallelujah, I like that. It's good stuff, right? But how about the other ones? You will be hated by all men for my name's sake. Oh, Lord, that cannot be really in Scripture. Come on now. Those who live righteous in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Oh, no, no, we've got to get that out of the Bible. That's a downer, isn't it? But you see, it's the whole council, right? Because it's the whole council of God that sets you completely free. And it's the everlasting gospel that brings everlasting life. And that's why God would have us to proclaim the full counsel of God so that people will pass from judgment and pass into life. Now, it's interesting in verse 6, continuing, how it says uh, every nation, tribe, tongue, and people are given a clear call to come to God. They are all given opportunities to come to God. One of the reasons, and I'll say this briefly, because it's something I really feel strongly and I could talk a lot about it, therefore I won't, I'll just say it briefly. One of the things that I'm serious when I say this, that I'm s sincere, that I love about this church, that I do, I love about this church that I'm part of, I get to sit up here and look at you guys. You see, you look at one person, but I look at all of you. And there is such a variety in here. Such a variety. Nations, tongues, people are represented right here. Right here. Right here. If I had each person stand up and say, can you tell me what your background is? You, you, you here? I'm from Brazil. I'm from Puerto Rico. My family's from Ireland. You know, from Africa. I mean, you name it. From China, you, you, you know, the Philippines, as I look out, and I know, I know some of you, and I know you were from here, you were from there, Raul was from Mars, I mean, I know that, <laughs> from different places, Germany, the gospel goes out to all people. And what I love about it is uh, there's only one color that God recognizes, red, the blood of Jesus that cleanses us from all of our sin. And so this word, this gospel goes out, and it's a call to all to come to faith in Christ. Now, Jesus had said that before the end comes, that the world would hear the gospel of the kingdom. In Matthew 24, verse 14 he said, this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. And so the preaching of the angel will reach those who have 
not yet heard the gospel. Now it says in verse 7, saying with a loud voice, fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment has come. Worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea and springs of water. So the gospel message is intended to bring unbelievers worldwide to faith in God through Jesus Christ. And in that message, they're called to fear God, to give God glory, and to worship him. Now, when he says fear God, that's just another way of saying change your allegiance from the beast, because that's where their allegiance has been. Change your allegiance from the beast and give that allegiance to God. To fear God. To fear God is to live in the conscious awareness of his holiness and his power. To live in the conscious awareness of his holiness and his power. God calls us to be aware of his righteous anger towards sin. And it's the fear of God that causes us to live in a way that we avoid the habit of sin, fear of God. The unbeliever, the Bible makes it very clear, has no fear of God within them at all. There were these two thieves that were placed on crosses next to Jesus when Jesus died. And we know the story. We know that how one of the thieves at a certain point as he was there dying next to Jesus began to blaspheme Jesus even while they were dying. It's found in the Gospel of Luke in chapter 23. And when this, when this one thief, you know, if you're the Son of God, take us off of this, this cross. And he's, and, he's, he's, and he's blaspheming the Lord. He's Basically saying, since you're not doing it, you have no value. Blasphemy is simply reducing God to being without value. As this is taking place, the other answering rebuked him, saying, Do you not even fear God, seeing you are under the same condemnation? Do you not fear God? Here's something for you, Romans chapter 3, verse 18, speaking of unbelievers. Uh, there's no fear of God before their eyes. You can watch a TV program that will use the name of the Lord in vain. It's on TV. It doesn't have to be a cable thing at all. It could be on any of the major networks. They'll use God's name in vain. I've heard it. You have too. And I'll turn to Marie and I'll say, when did that become acceptable? They will use the name of the Lord in vain. And what did God say? I will not hold him guiltless who takes my name in vain. God said that. His word says that. This person who is scripted to use the name of God in vain, using God's name in that way, won't use other words that we have deemed to be inappropriate. He won't use certain languages or words. I mean, you picture him saying, man, that chick. Oh, no, no, all the women would get upset. We're not chicks. We're chickens. No, we're not. <laughs> you can't use words. You know what I'm speaking about. We all know that. Some words, we won't even use the whole word. We just have a letter for it. You can't use some words, but you can use the name of God in vain. Because the unbeliever, listen, this is very important, has no fear of God in them. They don't care. There's no fear of God in them at all. It doesn't matter at all. I use his name. He didn't do anything to me. And so here's something. Here's a, a, an application for us. Be very careful that you as a believer, that you cultivate a healthy fear of the Lord. Let me make it practical and move on a little bit more. Believe it or not, in the ministry, pastors have opportunities to fail all the time. All the time. It would not be hard for me to steal money. 
It wouldn't be. Everybody trusts me. It wouldn't be hard for me to come up here and say, you know, we really need. And there are generous souls, one or two, in this church <laughs> who are visitors. Um, <laughs> who would immediately respond. I mentioned we had the tsunami that hit the um, Asia. Um, I, I simply mentioned to the church, there's a need. We have to do something. And, within two, and I never received an offering, never received an offering. And in, within two, no more than three weeks, we saw 140-some thousand dollars come in so we could give and help. That's happened more than once. People are generous. And if there's a need, they will give to it. There's no doubt about that. They do. They're that way. That's what believers do. I could take advantage of that. Why don't I? There have been people, women, believe this or not, who have thought that they're supposed to be with me and my wife isn't in this church and made it, made it obvious. Why didn't I run off with her? Oh, because you love your wife. Absolutely. Because she'd kill you. You know that for a fact. <laughs> you want to know the absolute truth? The fear of God. The fear of God. I am serious when I say that. If I had no fear of God, why would I care about what man thinks? So what? I was a hippie. I didn't care. You don't like me? I don't care. Who needs you? That's what hippies were like. I don't need you. I don't need anything. I just need some dope. That's all I need. Place to crash. Something to drink. I don't care. It's the fear of the Lord. That is so basic but it is missing in the body of Christ today. When you have people saying that worship is really about you, it's a lack of the fear of God. It's a lack of understanding. That's what that is. You see, the fear of the Lord leads us to honor, to respect, to love, and to worship God. The fear of the Lord produces a life of holiness, a life of wisdom, and even a life of security in him. In 2 Corinthians 7, 1, Paul said, Therefore, having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Proverbs 1, 7, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. Proverbs 14, 26, In the fear of the Lord... There is strong confidence his children will have a place of refuge. And so this gospel that is being preached, this everlasting gospel calls people to fear the Lord and to no longer be associated with Antichrist. It's interesting that after 12 chapters of writing of the vanity of life, Solomon concluded of Ecclesiastes in chapter 12, verse 13, with these words. He said, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. And he said, fear God and keep his commandments, for this is man's all. And so that's what the Lord has called us to. Now, why would this word be going out, fear God? Well, the hour of judgment has come. He is the creator of all things. And so fearing God is going to result in giving glory to him and worshiping him. And so he's saying, worship the judge and creator of all things, not creation itself. Under such intense tribulation, as we've seen, people are not repenting. But what has happened is they've become concerned with their daily needs. They're pursuing food. They're pursuing the water, uh, clean air. But they don't recognize that God is bringing his judgment. In verse 8, it says, another angel followed, saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she has made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Now, this angel is not preaching good news. 
this angel is bringing word of judgment. And that reveals that the first angel's message is mainly being ignored. Now, we're going to look at this more closely when we get into chapter 18, guys, but we're looking at Babylon for just a moment. There are various views of this Babylon. When it says Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, there are various views of what Babylon or what city they're referring to. There are those who say, well, Babylon is the city of Jerusalem, just being given the name Babylon. There are others who are saying, well, there is a literal Babylon. And then there is a time when the church believed that this was a code word for the, uh, uh, the city of Rome. What we do know, and we'll look at it, like I said, later on, but it most definitely speaks of Antichrist's polit political, economic, and religious empire. Now, one thing I want to share with you briefly about Babylon. Well, the first Babylon is mentioned in the book of Genesis. And when you look at Babylon, you see that it was guilty of rebelling against God. Babylon originally was founded by a man by the name of Nimrod. And when you look at uh, the book of Genesis and you begin to look at, at Babylon and all under Nimrod, you see that it actually had what would be called an organized system of idolatry. You hear of the Tower of Babel. And while the Tower of Babel is, uh, is what is called a ziggurat, a ziggurat was an, is, is, is used in a variety of ways, but one of it is as an astrological tower where they actually had gone to the, into the tower and they were actually charting the stars and they were into astrology and horoscopes and had gotten into the worship of the creation rather than the creator who is God and blessed forever. And so God, as we know the story of the first Babylon, confounds their language. And in doing so, they cease that particular rebellion at that time, but it actually simply spreads throughout the earth. In the beginning, man united to reject and rebel against God. They're going to do that also in the end. The world is going to be intoxicated with the Babylonian false religion of Antichrist. And so instead of the wine of the Spirit, they're going to drink deeply of the false wine of Babylon. And as a result of that, they're going to be judged. In verse 9 and 10, it says, The third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast in his image and receives his mark on his forehead or on his hand, he himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation. He shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And so as we already note, everyone, everyone's going to be required to receive a mark in order to buy or to sell hand and the forehead. And what happens is, is worshiping the beast in his image is going to ultimately demonstrate the loyalty that they have and the allegiance that they have to the beast. So those who drank of the wine of the harlot will ultimately drink of the wrath of God. And the full fury of the wrath of God is going to be poured out in full strength, undiluted. And there will be no mercy given to those who rejected him. Psalm 75, 7 and 8 says, It is God who judges. He brings one down. He exalts another. In the hand of the Lord is a cup full of foaming wine mixed with spices. He pours it out, and all the wicked of the earth drink it down to its very dregs. He's going to pour his fury and his wrath out on those who reject. Now notice in verse 10, punishment, it speaks of punishment. He shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels. That's an interesting scripture. And in the presence of the Lamb. This is speaking of a continual and permanent torment. Jesus spoke more about judgment. He spoke more about hell. Think about this, guys, for a minute, please, than he did about heaven. Isn't that interesting? Why? Because he wants to save us from hell. He gave a lot of warnings. You see, they will be tormented. That word tormented, I looked it up today. I wanted to make sure. It speaks of torture. Tormented with fire and brimstone. Fire and brimstone is symbolic of judgment throughout Scripture. 
but they're going to experience continual and permanent torment. There are those who think, well, what if you stay in there a little while? Can you get out eventually? No, you don't. In Matthew 25, 41, uh, we read, Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you who are cursed, into the eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. It wasn't prepared for man. It was prepared for the devil and his angels. And God has done something to keep us from going there, but these people will not repent. The Bible in Revelation 20 in verse 15 says, If anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. They will be banished from God's presence relationally. They will have no fellowship with him. I want you to notice something. It's interesting here. It says, he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. How interesting is that? So they are going to be banished from a relationship with God. They will have no fellowship with God, but though they don't have fellowship with him, God still is going to be one who rules. He rules over him, and therefore they're still subject to him. And because of his omnipresence, though they don't have relationship with him, yet at the same time, they will be in a particular sense still aware of the reality of God, though they have no fellowship with him. It's like what it says in Psalm 139, 7 and 8, well, where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend into heaven, you're there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, you are there. They have no relationship, but that doesn't mean that God is not present in a particular sense, and this occurs in front of him or in his presence, meaning he is a witness of what has taken place. Notice verse 11. The smoke of their torment ascends forever and ever. They have no rest day or night who worship the beast and his image, whoever receives the mark of, the, mark of his name. I had somebody say once, um, yeah, I'm going to hell, but that's okay. All my friends are going there too. He was serious. And um, we'll just party. You know, when you, when you read about hell, um, it, it's not a place you want to go. I, 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 I will try and illustrate it kind of like this. I don't, I don't know a better way to do it. Jesus describes it as a place where the fire doesn't end and the worm dies not. It's a perpetual, it's a continual thing, and it's filled with decay and death. One of the, one of the words translated um, hell is the word Guiana. The word Guiana comes from the Valley of Hinnom. The Valley of Hinnom is just outside of the city of Jerusalem. It's where the refuse was burned. So the trash would be taken to the Valley of Hinnom. In the ancient history of Israel, it's a place where children had actually been sacrificed to false gods. So in the imagery of Guiana or hell, there is a place, it's a place of death, it's a place of, uh, of uh, fire that doesn't stop because it kept the fires stoked because people would bring their trash and it would just continue to be burned. And that's why he said the fire doesn't die and the worm doesn't because there's so much decay. There are always maggots and things there. So Jesus used this image to, to attempt to get into the mind of the people that that's a place you don't want to go. In the Old Testament book of Daniel, in chapter 12, verse 2, it says, Many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, some to shame and everlasting contempt. Again, I mentioned this. It's found in Matthew, uh, rather Mark 9, 43 through 48, how Jesus speaks of if your hand offends you or your foot offends you, your eye causes you to sin. He says it is better to enter heaven maimed. He says cut it off. It's better to enter heaven maimed uh, than to be cast into hell fire where their worm doesn't die and the fire is not quenched. And so what you have is a picture of judgment that is continuing. The way eternal life is continuing, the judgment is continuing also. A 
place of no escape without fellowship with God. Jesus warns us about it. And he does so because he doesn't want us to go there. Do I believe in hell? I do. Do I believe enough in hell? I need to start deepening my understanding of that. I'll be honest with you. One great evangelist said that he wanted to take those whom he was training to preach the gospel. He said, I wish there was a way that I could take them and, and dangle them by the edge of hell for just a moment so they could see the damnation of human souls so that would ignite within them a fire and a passion for the saving of mankind if we could only get a clearer vision of the judgment because that way we'd have more power when we preach of salvation. And so this is a judgment that will take place, and it's a continual one. And if they take the mark of this beast, there's no recovering them. Verse 12, here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. I heard a voice from heaven saying to me, write, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors and their work follows them. Those who have trusted Jesus will evidence their trust by holding fast and living in faithful obedience. The tribulation saints who die, die with an assurance, holding on to the promises of God. There are some who will die, but they die as believers, and they hold fast to the eternal life that's been granted to them by faith, and they're blessed. He makes it clear that works will follow them, meaning the record of their service to God is honored and honored with reward. It's like what we read in Hebrews 6.10. God is not unjust to forget your work and labor of love, which you have shown towards his name, in that you have ministered to the saints and do minister. God remembers the works that you did, and he rewards you accordingly. And there is a proper place of reward for serving the Lord, and he's making it very clear right now. They will rest from the labors, but their works do follow them.